But meeting editors and agents. Basically, as it stands right now, the best way uh, to break in, your best shot is still to publish through New York. Now, if you were going to, let's say, hypothetically, you're going to submit your story to two editors. Or let's, let's reverse that. There are two of you that are going to submit to an editor. One of you writes in their cover letter, Hi, I met you at Worldcon. When, after you taught, we're on this panel, you talked about writing magic systems and writing. And I really thought that your, um, your take on it was interesting. Um, I think my writing might be something you're interested in, because I actually have to share the same views. Um, I'm hoping you're willing to look at my fantasy novel, um, you know, um, Men Jump Off Cliffs and Fly. Um, <laughs> and the other one says, hello, um, to whom it may concern, um, here is my fantasy novel, Women Who Jump Off of, uh, Into Lakes and Fly. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, sincerely, Brad. Okay, whatever. Um, you're the editor looking at these two things. Which one do you read first? The one that, he said, that knows me. The one that met you, that took the time to actually research you as a person, who mentioned something that you had that taught them, that was paying attention and called you by name, and sent you a submission targeted at them. You're going to read that one first for sure. Okay? The other one goes on the stack of maybe I'll get to it. This one probably goes in that stack too, but it goes above the other one, um, to be perfectly honest. All right? So what that. The top? What's that? What goes in the top? Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I am your daughter's um, okay. high school teacher who said that, you know, you would, uh, you would look at my book if in exchange I gave your daughter extra tutoring, whatever. Um, or, hi, it's your best friend from college who has now written a book. I mean, come on. Uh, no, no, that, what goes on the top above that is, Hi, I'm George R. R. Martin. <laughs> right? Hi, I'm Neil Gaiman. Um, right, um, track record. Um, goes on top of those, if we're going to be realistic, things that you can actually do. Goes on top of those is, Hi, I've been published in Asimov's three times and I've won Writers of the Future. I've, so far I've not sold a novel, but I've written one and I hope you would be interested in looking at it. That goes on the very top of the slush pile submissions. Um, trumping that is still, hi, I'm Matt Bialer, one of the top agents in the business, and I've known you for 30 years, and I've got a hot new writer whose um, writing is fantastic, um, and you need to look at it because I'm going to send it to auction next week. That goes above that. It doesn't go above George R. R. Martin, but it goes, <laughs> above, it goes above anyone else unpublished. Okay? Um, my power agent is going to mean a lot for you. Uh, we'll talk about agents later on, but you can meet them at these things too. Agents stealth it, by the way. Uh, yeah, you have to do your work really hard to find the agents. They hide. Um, <laughs> editors editors um, have lived their lives being the unsung heroes of science fiction and fantasy. Um, they come to these cons and are ecstatic about the fact that now they get to be the celebrity. Um, and they get to sit on the con, uh, on the panel and just talk about the books that they love, that they're publishing, that they've worked on, and how awesome they are because they became an editor in the first place because they love science fiction and fantasy novels, and they want to talk about how awesome um, science fiction and fantasy novels are. Editors usually are going to be much more approachable in some ways than agents, but they'll also have a flock of people hunting them down. Um, and they will learn to dodge that flock of people um, quite astutely. Um, so... Anyway, um, you will meet the editors and agents. We'll talk about more, a little bit more about how to accomplish this in a minute. But number three, learn about <coughs> most of these conventions will have nice panels of science fiction and fantasy authors who will talk to you about the craft. Uh, Dragon Con has an excellent children's writing track, meaning it has very good authors presenting how to write um, how to write uh, children's books. Um, they have a dedicated track for that. Um, usually all the cons will have a writing track. Um, some of them will have a children's writing track. Um, Dragon Con has one of the best ones um, that I've been to of this type of con. Yes? So, sorry, on, back on, on the editors and agents thing. Yes. How, so how do you meet editors? I'm editors? going to talk about it. That's okay. what I said. Don't worry. We're getting there. Um, so, learn your craft. You will get... Um, Versions of what I'm doing here, 
taught at the conventions. Uh, different conventions will do a better job of it, but almost all of them will have something related to this. All right? Yes? You mentioned the Nebula Weekend. What does that serve in the line of, like, um, It's over here. Um, it, and, it, yeah, Nebula. It's like between these two, but it's more of a mini convention, meaning usually it only has one or two days of programming and not as many tracks. It's much smaller. Um, but you have to look and see what they're doing for the given year. Ask Mary. She's at LTUE this, um, this week, and she's, uh, she's the vice president of CIFWA. Um, Nebula is the, the Science Fiction Fantasy Award given out by, the, um, by CIFWA, the Science Fiction Writers Association of America. It's like, you know, the Oscars. It's voted on by the members of CIFWA. So, um, and she's here. She's vice president. Uh, Scalzi is still president, I think. Um, Scalzi! Um, and I, I had to do that because, you know, I'm on camera, so I have to make sure that I'm keeping up the uh, tradition. Um, but, yeah, anyway, so, learn your craft. Uh, number four, meet authors. Um, meeting authors can be very helpful for networking. Um, you can also get your book signed. Um, but it, it helps you, just you can ask the authors questions such as, who is your agent and are they here? <laughs> Is that them over there? Thank you very much. Um, but, uh, but, you know, asking, you know, what is your experience with such and such or this? Or Sanderson writes this way. How do you approach it? Uh, tell me how he's wrong. That can be very useful for you, and the authors are extremely approachable at these things. Uh, you can sign up for what they call coffee clutches, which are a little round table where about eight people sit down with an author, agent, or editor, whichever ones are willing to do the coffee clutch, and you sit and chat with them for an hour, eight of you. Uh, they're wonderful things. I would highly recommend them as one of your best modes of attack. And so if you're wanting to meet editors and agents, editors do them fairly frequently, agents do them infrequently, but still do them. Um, authors do them a lot. And so you can get lots of good information and help. Uh, five, meet other aspiring writers. Being part of serious and um, serious and skilled groups of aspiring writers can be extremely helpful for you. Um, you can meet them, you can um, you can trade notes about different publishers, you can try different tactics. It's just good business to network with them, okay? Yes? Um, what were those things that those authors go to again? Coffee. coffee Clutch. It stands for coffee. You go and have coffee with the writer. Um, or your favorite beverage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, obviously have much coffee at my coffee clutches, but they do give you free coffee um, or hot chocolate in my case. Um, so. Meeting other aspiring writers, equally helpful, okay? So, these can, things can be very useful for you. I will talk more about this one in a second, but... You can replace this by doing it other ways. For instance, you can replace it poorly by following the editor's and agent's blogs. Uh, this is something that I would highly recommend that you all be doing anyway. Should be looking for their blogs. Or do you say, how do you find their blogs? <coughs> Trial and error, and um, searching, and. Because I've, I've tried that, and I'm not an idiot. But yeah. I can't find. They're not blogs. very. They're not terribly good at publicizing them. Okay. But if you get onto like one of the industry blogs, some of them blog anonymously, and you can just follow those blogs. Um, um, but if you get on one, they'll often have the blog roll on the side. You can kind of click on the others and start figuring out who people are. Um, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, who is an editor at Tor, runs Making Light, which is mostly a left-wing political blog. So if you happen to be left-wing political, you're going to love his blog. Um, if you're not, then, but you know, um, yeah, but it is his blog. Joshua, my agent, runs a blog. Um, I think it's linked on his website. Uh, so um, I think it's probably awfulagent.blogspot, but it might be like really blogger or something. I don't know. He, he uses all sorts of different things. Um, I've got it RSS, but I don't know what it is. Look on his website. Um, it'll mention his blog somewhere, I think. Um, follow their tweets, their Twitter. I mean, my editor, Moshe, 
has a Twitter feed. Um, he doesn't update regularly, but he also has a Facebook page that he does. Um, and, you know, they're almost all going to have something like this. I don't know because when I broke in, these things didn't exist. And so I wasn't following them. Um, blogging exploded. When did blogging explode? It's like five or six years ago. The blogging's like, boom, blogging! Maybe it was as early as like, you know, 2000, but I don't think it was, because in 2000, like, Google barely existed in 2000. Um, so, you know, I broke it in 2003. Um, I went, started going to cons in, in, in 2000, and they were very useful for me. But anyway, all right. So, you can kind of replace these things a little bit poorly by doing this. You can also replace them by reading the books that the editors and agents have worked on. Okay? This is harder, even harder than the blogs, because you have to find out what they're working on. But if you can figure out what they're working on and read those books, you can start to judge whether or not you're a good match for that, um, for that editor or agent. Every time I say something like that around my editor or agent, they cringe because they're like, I don't want them to look at the books that I've published and just give me something like that. I will publish, you know, if it's awesome, I'll publish it no matter what. That's what they say. Realistically, <laughs> they will tend to have certain themes that they like. Uh, Joshua has a certain type of book that he really um, enjoys and gets behind. That's my agent. Um, and if it's not that type, even if it's an excellent book, he won't choose to represent it. So being familiar with the type of books that Joshua represents can be very helpful for you. So, knowing the names of the editors, I think Tor's editors are all listed on Wikipedia. Um, le learning the names of the different editors, uh, reading their books, being familiar with them, at least can give you a bit of a leg up. We go back to our hypothetical people sending books, you know, submissions to Tor, and you are the editor and you get one that is, you know, hello, hey, dear Patrick Nielsen Hayden. I really like Cory Doctorow's books. Um, I know you've worked, you edit them, and I've also read your blog, and you know, you mentioned this and this and this, and you know, I've been very impressed with you as an editor. Um, I was hoping you would be interested in my book because of this and this and this that matches what the sort of thing that you seem like you would like. Of course, write it more professionally than that, but sincerely, Mark. Um, as opposed to, dear editor, here is my book. You're gonna, that one is gonna mean a little bit more to you. Now, as soon as you can replace those with some, some serious credits, um, you would want to, but the only real ways to pro replace those with serious credits without publishing a novel is to do short stories, which I don't suggest if you are not a short story writer. If you don't read them, if you don't write them, then, you're, then pursuing that venue despite what the old guard would say, it's not going to be very productive for you. Old guard will say, go write some short stories, get good at this business, and then you will then get published. Um, if you're good at it, if you like it, if you read them, go for it. It is a good way to get your foot in the door. If you don't, do not spend the next 10 years learning to write short stories so that you can get a novel contract that you haven't practiced writing novels in order to make use of, okay? All right, so meeting the editors and agents. Let's, let's do a little sub-theme on meeting the editors and agents. Um, this will go regardless of where you go to meet them. And you probably do want to try to meet them. So, you do not go with your manuscript. Um, is that the right abbreviation? I can never remember. MS. Is it MS? Yeah. What's MSS? Is that manuscripts? Manuscripts. manuscripts. Yeah. I don't go with plural. <laughs> don't go with manuscripts either. It means um, your plural wives. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, don't go with your manuscript unless you're at a conference which says you will have a pitch or workshop session. Some of them will say. They will tell you if you should bring a manuscript. Otherwise, you do not want to walk up with a manuscript. Why don't you want to walk up to the manuscript? Anyone know? Oh, oh gosh, I'll have to roll away. Yes, exactly. You got it. Nailed it. <laughs> Are, you're an editor? Oh, yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. So, um... Sorry, Brandon. Yes. What about if you made, like, business cards? Just so they have something to Yeah, business cards are good. Okay, let's do... Yes. Cards. 
they will throw them away, but it's, um, it's worth having something to give them just in case. Um, and maybe they will dig it out. Maybe they'll say, oh, you know, because people don't do business cards as much anymore. So maybe they will dig yours out, but that is a good thing. Um, I would say yes, but don't go with the manuscript. Um, do uh, go with a pitch. Oh, not, that's something not. Pitch. Okay? Be ready to give your pitch if prompted. Okay? Do not go right into pitch. Okay? Meaning, you're not going to walk up and say, I want to pitch my book to you, can I? If you're really confident, you might be able to get away with that one. Um, but usually, you want to say into the pitch when they give you an opportunity for it. This means you should, when you can do it, go with, once your book is finished. I would suggest you go anyway um, before, but certainly you want to get a book finished. You want to be going with something in hand, metaphorically, <laughs> that you can give to them, okay? Um, so, um, do not go in costume. <laughs> Um, that's fine on the days when you're not pitching to the editors, um, but leave the costume at home. Um, also, um, yes, dress nicely, but not too nice. No suits, then. Yeah, no suits. It would be my suggestion. Business casual would be fine. Um, even ni nice, um, nice jeans and, you know, turn leg. Um, what Brandon would wear to teach class in. I guess, um, would be fine. Um, you probably, yeah, just don't want to do anything too wacky. Don't go with like a blinking button that says, uh, you know, ask me if I'm a Borg, um, or something like that, you know. Um, uh, I'm sure they exist. Um, yeah. Um, but, are you a Borg? <laughs> um, but, yeah. In other words, kind of present yourself. Remember, you're going to this as a, a professional. Um, you are a pro, so dress like it. But suits, this is not an industry where anyone really wears suits, okay? We, we publish science fiction fantasy books, okay? I mean, Tom Doherty, yeah, Tom usually kind of wears a suit or something. But nobody else really does, uh, except for Lee Modisit. Um, <laughs> Um, but if suits are your thing, you can wear them eventually, but, you know, that would be my suggestion. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to find the editor. How do you find the editor? Well, step one, see if there are any panels or any coffee clutches. Step two, ask their um, authors if their editor is there. Um, step three, troll the bars or parties if you feel um, up to that. Troll, not as in, te you know, troll as in pulling something behind you, not as in, um, large hair and different colors and lives under bridges. Um, so, to do that last one, you're going to need to know what they look like. Not too hard with Google. Stalk them just a little bit. It's okay. They're looking to make a professional contact. Don't send them stuff in the mail, but go ahead and look and see what they look like. At, at the cons, they usually actually have um, ro rotating around world cons, a big photos of the professionals, that, like famous ones that have been taken over the years, and you can go find the editors there. Um, but yeah, kind of know what they look like. It's going to be not too easy, but it's, um, it's worth doing. Once you find them, ask if you can have a few minutes of their time. Be polite. Let's put that under here. Polite. They are there professionally meaning they're expecting to be approached, okay? Um, it's part of the business. But that doesn't mean that they owe you any time. So, walk that balance there. Where you go from there is your call, okay? By the way, from now on, you're not allowed to say, Brandon sent me. <laughs> Why? Because of the last convention? Um, uh, David Hartwell, editor at Tor, um, was there, and I mentioned some of my, some of my students, hey, David Hartwell's here um, at the con. You guys should go talk to him. Every one of them went and said, Brandon said I should talk to you. That's a bad way to introduce yourself. 
Okay, do you, do you understand why that would be a bad way to introduce yourself? No longer are you, I am a writer wanting to, um, to show you about my work. Instead, I am a student on an assignment. How, what's the different mindset there for an editor? Bad idea, okay? Don't go there and say Brandon sent you. Um, all right, if I give you a tip that someone's around, it's not, you, that you can't lean on me anymore. Yes? Also, wouldn't that be unfortunate for you if... Yes, because then David Hartwell came to me and said, please don't let, send any of your students to me anymore. Okay? Bad for me, bad for all the other students. Um, I'm sure, you know, I, I never mentioned this to them. Um, I kind of thought they would understand it, but yeah. So Hartwell um, said, please don't point me out to students anymore. Um, because of that. So I'm sorry, but that's what happened. Um, um, but you are not going as a student. You are not there as Brandon's student if you do this. Okay? You are there as an aspiring writer looking to learn. And how you approach this editor really depends on who you are and what you're wanting to do. Um, if you want to ask them a bit of advice, go with that route. If you want to compliment them on a book you've read, go that route. Um, your goal should be to let them talk and not focus on yourself. This is kind of basic interaction with other people. Um, I'm sure if you read How to Make Plant Friends and Influence People, it would tell you how to do this much better than I will. But basic sort of networking things. Find out about what they're working on. This sort of thing. Um, you've got two goals and um, you uh, let's say you've got three goals. Um, one of them is just to have met them. And at that point, it doesn't matter what you say as long as it's not stupid, okay? You check that one off. Um, goal two is to submit. That'll be the best one if you can get it. But goal three is to find out more about them as an editor because that's going to help you. I would, if I were you, do what I did, which is have a little book. Just like people have a little black book of, um, of former loves or people they're interested in. You have a black book of editors. You will have a page for each editor or at least each publishing house and you will start writing down the editors, books they've edited, what they've said at conventions, um, what their editorial style is, what they seem to be looking for, all of those sorts of things. So that you then have your book full of information um, and you can get that by saying, what are you working on? What, um, what new authors have you picked up recently? Why did you pick them up? Tell me about the book. I want to read it. That I want to read what you're working on is very good because you are less me focused and more finding out focused. Okay? At the end of the conversation, or you know, you can approach it how you want. Some of you may be through the, uh, the Marriott School and they'll teach you high powered ways to do stuff better than this. Um, probably listen to your professors there instead, but I would say at the end what I usually did was, um, I have a book that I think you would like. Would you mind if I sent it to you? Um, nine times out of ten they said, yeah sure, here's my card. Or, yeah sure, um, the information's on the website. Uh, usually they gave me a card. Said, yeah, send me three chapters and a synopsis. Sounds good. Um, once in a while they said, tell me about it. Where is that? Pitch. That's why you have the pitch ready so you don't go. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll talk about pitches next. Um, so have your pitch ready. Yeah, Mark. Does this all this go for edit, or, uh, agents as well? Yeah. I'll go through, I'll go for agents as well. You're fine. Um, so let's go for questions about this stuff before I get into some big sort of things. This is the big two by four of information for which with which I've just smacked you. Are there any differences with agents? You're dealing with an agent, and they're more. They seem from your description to be more reticent. They are a little more reticent, not necessarily more reticent, but they don't generally go sit on the panels. What I've just found about agents is that they aren't as accessible that way, but they're actually there networking more consciously. The editors are like, yeah, if people come to me and want to send me books, great. The agents are actively searching for really good authors, but they're doing it, they they're tend to be much better. You know, <coughs> agents tend to be more Marriott School type people, okay? And editors tend to be more, um, 
Big Bang Theory type people. <laughs> okay? Um, they do this, they both do it because they love it, but if you're going to be an agent, agent is a confrontational business. All right? You are negotiating contracts. You are the loud voice of anger when your author wants something changed. You don't become an agent if you are an extreme introvert who can't handle conflict. Okay? You do become an editor sometimes <laughs> if you're an extreme introvert and can't handle conflict. All right? So that different personality type, you know, there's going to be lots of bleed. Okay? That's not, but those are kind of the archetypes for the editors and agents and you will find them. I should mention up here the difference between editors and publishers. Does anyone know the difference? Because I didn't when I first started. Publisher can fire the agent? Yeah, the editor you mean? Yeah. Or the editor, yeah. Um, publishers are not editors. Publishers do not, um, sometimes both, one person will hold both roles, but the publisher is the business person who runs a business. For instance, Tom Dory. Tom Doherty started Tor Books in the early 80s, um, maybe late 70s, um, after a long history in publishing. He founded the company and he hired Harriet McDougall, Robert Jordan's wife, who wasn't his wife then, hadn't met him yet, um, hired her to be his editorial director and acquire books for him to sell. Okay? That's a, those are two very different roles. Now, a lot of times people will cross over between those roles and you'll have someone like... Um, like uh, the guy from Pyre, I know Lou his name, Anders. Lou Anders. Lou Anders, who is both, um, because it's kind of it's an imprint. He's wearing both hats. But at the bigger co co um, companies, the publishers, the publishers can do anything. They can buy your book. They're really powerful. But shooting for a publisher is kind of a hard task because they usually aren't going to read any slush. That's n that's not their job. Their job is to market and sell the books and run the business. Um, it's the editors they hire to do that. Okay. So, um, but differences, agents, um, agents tend to be more like talent scouts. They're there at the con scouting for the talent. Um, whereas the editors tend to be fishermen, like who are just got a big, you know, net and they're throwing it out and pulling a bunch of stuff in and saying, is this a good fish now? Is this a good fish now? Is this a good fish? And the agents are like the sharks in the water hunting the good fish, okay? <laughs> Do uh, people usually get agents or editors first? It's an excellent question. Um, do people usually get agents or editors first? I'm going to give you a gummy because that was a good question. Um, and it depends on who you talk to. Um, my experience has been it's about 50-50. Um, if you get a good agent, you will probably sell your book. But getting a good agent is hard. Um, you can, in science fiction and fantasy, sell your book without an agent. Um, in children's, you almost can't, all right, um, because it is more corporate. Um, there is a school of thought that says you should ignore any time an editor says they do not take unagented submissions. There is this thing in, um, in New York where unagented submissions, meaning some publishing houses just don't look at submissions that aren't from agents. The good news is if you meet one of those editors at a con and you do this whole thing, and they say, send it to me, that's no longer you know, an unsolicited submission. It's a solicited submission. In fact, if an editor ever says to you, yeah, I'll look at it, even you know, whatever they say, you send it in the mail the next day, overnight. It. Okay? You don't go with the manuscript, but you jump on it when you can send them one. And you go ahead and write requested material on there, as long as you can construe it as being requested. Would it be favorable to have like a little SD disk with your manuscript on it, that if it's solicited, you can mm. hand it to them? Mm. Nope. Okay. Nope. Never give them anything at a con unless they ask for it. Um, the reason being, yeah, they don't want to, they're there networking, but they're not there reading. They want to get back to the office and have it there. Um, and if you give it to them, you're just asking them to, to, to schlep it back to the office and remember where it is and not for, lose it or things like that, just I would say no. You can have one. Just on the one in a million chance to say, you got a copy? They might. They probably won't, but they might. Because they could be like, ah, I'm bored today. I don't have anything to read. You got a copy? Bing! You could be just fine with that if you wanted to. But never unless they ask that. And you said overnight it. Um, yeah. Where most of them are taking email submissions now. Yeah. Are you still overnight? Or send it, well, if they let you send it physically, I would probably send it physically because this is a slow-moving business. 
Um, people are still used to reading physically. And um, I would go ahead and send it physically with like then with the little SD card or something like that attached. <coughs> um, or send it physically and by email or something. But it's so much harder to ignore something physical. That probably will eventually go away. But for now, I would go ahead and do both if I could. That was my question. OK, yeah. Um, if they only take e-submissions, um, oh well, um, that's going to be just fine. And it's easier on you. You don't have to do what I did and print out a manuscript for 100 bucks and ship it for 20 and then have it disappear into the void. <laughs> What about some rules for the format that you send it to them? I mean, is there only a certain font and a certain size? And That's a good question. Um, there, I'm, I'm going to throw you one of yours back now. Woo! Hey, that was, that was a good in. Mm -hmm. I'll throw one to you because you had a good question and you didn't ask it. And you had like five. <laughs> um, okay, so. Because um, I already have a business card to pay for my tickets to the conferences. Um, once upon a time, there was a very set way to do it, there is no longer. I'm just gonna I'm gonna say that. Um, don't put in the weird font, but they can change it in 10 seconds, and they probably have a macro that does it. Um, so just don't do anything weird unless they suggest. If your default these days is different than what it used to be when I was breaking it, your default should probably just be whatever you know Times New Roman or Calgary, whatever the one that you know 11 point double spaced, always double space it, um, but and put put uh, put numbers. Um, page numbers on. Whatever the writing guidelines are, follow them. Yeah, do follow them whatever the writing guidelines are. Um, but if you're doing e-submissions, the writing guidelines, they've all begun getting relaxed. Um, but as long as you're not crazy, you're going to probably be OK. Do go and look and see if they have writer's guidelines and just do what they say. It'll take you 10 seconds, and it'll make you look more professional. OK? Other questions? All right, pitches. Um, let's talk pitches for a few seconds. Ideally, when you go, um, I would suggest you have prepared three different levels of pitches. One is your, um, your one sentence. Um, how, this is, what do they call this in Hollywood? Is this the elevator? elevator. Yeah, this is the elevator. What are they, uh, they call it log line, too. This is your log line. Elevator's usually 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah elevator's, uh, elevator's a little bit longer, I think. Um, so this is your log line. Let's just call it that. Log line or your one, your one sentence. This is, um, you have boiled your entire story down, your 300,000 word uh, epic fantasy novel, to one sentence. OK? Uh, for Mistborn, it's about a gang of thieves who try to overthrow the empire of the Dark Lord by robbing him silly and bribing his armies away from him. It cuts out almost everything, but it has, but it is one sentence. Okay. Number two, you have your elevator. We'll call this the elevator. T D T. Um, this is my Midwest background coming out. I want to say elevator. Um, so. Your elevator pitch is 30 seconds. This is a little bit longer. If it looks like, you know, if you usually want to start with the log line um, and then judge their interest. You say this, are they still listening? They go, huh. Then you go into your elevator pitch, which is a paragraph. Okay? There's a trick to saying these. And the trick is to not sound like it's the first time you've said it, not stumble, rehearse, but also not sound like a machine who's just spitting this out. You want to sound a little bit natural, if you can. My um, one sentence for, for Mistborn. A thousand years ago, there was this great hero who went on a quest to beat the Dark Lord, and he failed. Dark Lord killed him, took over the world. Now, a thousand years later, this is uh, a gang of thieves decide, OK, the prophecies were lies. Um, the hero didn't save them. Uh, they're going to do this, this their way. Uh, they're going to pull off the perfect heist. They're going to go take down the Dark Lord by robbing him, bribing his armies away from him, and overthrowing the Empire. Um, that's, a, that's a paragraph version of the one sentence. I kind of start with a little bit more history um, and things like that, okay? Um, 
for me, I always on Mistborn start with the um, with the concept because the concept is generally the driving force for the pitches. On other ones, I will start with the character. It depends. Okay. And then three is your one page. Um, this one, <coughs> be ready to talk about your book, write it out in one page. You can even bring that one page with you if you get to this um, stage uh, to give to them if they seem like they would like it or they're, like, you know, they're talking really interestingly about it. But um, basically this is just, if you get to this stage, you're awesome and you, you just hook the editor. Um, you're probably not going to get to this stage, but if you do, that's good. Um, another question kind of related to queries. Um, I remember them mentioning that they don't want any information left out, that they want the twist, they want to know oh, what yeah. happens. Um, is that the same way here where they not want to know? really. The one sheet, yes. Um, the elevator pitch, no. You, you can't, you, it doesn't matter. You know, you're just trying to hook them. Um, doing this at, um, appropriately is kind of a skill. Um, it is one that I have only learned after publishing the books because I had to pitch the book to hundreds of people who come through line asking, what is your book about? Actually, I don't have to do that anymore. Um, but early on, you'll stand, you know, stand at your little table at the Barnes and Noble and like look at people walking by, and you're like, "Hi, do you like books? <laughs> you're in a bookstore. Oh, you're in a coffee shop. Okay. Um, no, you, you guys kind of turn into a salesperson. Um, and a few things I learned: um, fewer names is better. You mean names of characters? Yep. Yep. Stay away from the page that is, you know, Jethro Ptolemy lives in the Ptolemaic Kingdom. He is one of the Yersiwin, who are a fantastical magic group of knights that fight with a magic cult. You're just defining things. Don't do that. Stay away from that. Um, mentioning a name is fine, um, but going into all your definitions of things, don't do that. Don't do that in your log line or your elevator. You can start a little bit in your one sheet, okay? So, fewer names equal better. Um, point number two, uh, pick, the mo pick something exciting. There should be one thing about your story, at least, that is just a good hook. What is your hook? Figure out what it is and pick it and talk about that. Your Goal is not to give them an overview of the whole book in this. Your goal is to make them want to read the book. And to do that, you pick one thing that is, is a core of your book. Don't make it something that's like not even really in there, but something that's a core of your book that can be interesting, exciting to talk about for 30 seconds. It'll make someone want to read your book. Um, it's very hard for writers because you want to give them all the coolness about your book. You can't do that. You can only do coolness about one or two things. In Hollywood, they would tell you to use the strange attractor. This is one way to do it. It is not the only way. You can read about pitching in um, Hollywood pitching online. Lots of people have written about it. I suggest you go do it if you're having troubles with this. But the strange attractor is the mash of a familiar element with an unfamiliar element. Okay? It's um, two things juxtaposed become uh, become awesome. I'm trying to think. Let's see if I can pop one out. Um, you, you, the cliché one, people always do this in movies. It's like, you know, Jane Austen meets zombies, right? That's a, a built-in strange attractor. Zombies people know about, Jane Austen people know about. You say Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, and boom, strange attractor. That's what they mean by this. And those concepts sell stories on their own. Alcatraz versus the evil librarians. Um, is a strange attractor. Evil librarians by itself. Uh, something familiar, mashed up in a different way. That's why in cliched Hollywood pitches they always say, it's like Star Wars meets Melrose Place. Um, you know, have you heard those types of pitches that people talk about, that they joke about in Hollywood? That's what a strange attractor is. That's a Hollywood pitch. Um, it's not a bad way to go if you've got a story that it works for. But don't think that every story you want to do is this meets this. That gets kind of old, and plus it doesn't always fit with your story. 
I found people that want to pitch that have spent a little bit too much time reading the Hollywood stuff always come with the, okay, it's this meets this. And then they give your, their pitch and it's really nothing like either of those things. They just thought that sounded cool, okay? So, um, practice doing this um, for movies you've seen. In fact, there are websites that will say, okay, you know, take this movie and do it, and then here are other ones people have come up with, and you can see how it goes. Um, pitching is hard, but you should be prepared to pitch your story just in case. Questions? All right. So, yeah. Is your one page your the same thing as your query letter? Yeah, your one page is more of your one sheet synopsis. Your query letter is more this thing. Your elevator. Okay. Um, Though, as mentioned by Travis, um, usually whenever you're writing a synopsis, particularly when you get the one sheet, uh, don't hold back. Don't make it sound too much like a movie trailer. Um, meaning, you want to go ahead and give the entire story when you're pitching it to the editor um, in your synopsis. And most of them, generally, I don't know, do they still do this, Jen? Do they still do the whole one, three chapters and a synopsis thing? Is that what they're, yeah. So they're going to say through chapter and synopsis. Your synopsis is basically your one sheet. Um, keep your, your synopsis under two pages. Um, yeah. Is there a word count for those chapters? Just don't be dumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of them will say 100 pages, uh, double spaced, um, is what they mean by that. But really, they're, remember, remember the piano metaphor? They can tell on page one, just like you can tell a bad pianist, they can tell a bad writer on page one. Paragraph one. Um, and so they want to have a, a, a page to be able to tell, OK, is this a bad pianist? And if you aren't, that doesn't necessarily mean you can still hold the story. It just means that you can hold the prose. At that point, they want to read two or three chapters to get a feel for if you, they feel like you can hold the story, if you can carry it off. And so give them enough that they can do that, but don't overload them. If your chapters are like, um, if your chapters are like two pages long, Honestly, if I were you, I would go and take ten of those and name them chapter one, <laughs> just for your um, for your, your submissions. You know, put line breaks in between instead, um, and then get them a nice yeah, get them get them fifty or sixty pages is what I would shoot for for one of these, no more than a hundred. Yes. Do you have any advice when an editor asks you a question after you've pitched and you can't think of an answer? Uh, better luck next time. <laughs> yeah. Um, it happens to all of us. Uh, so that's why you're getting a college degree, right? So you can learn to talk about things at length when you don't really know what the answer should be. <laughs> so this kind of took our whole time, didn't it? Um, but we'll we'll do let's do a few more questions here. So if you get through all this and you send them the two chapters and they read it, how often do they continue? Miss Snark said that um, roughly, and she was a literary agent. She said, "Anyone read this?" I sent sent people to look at it one year, um, and I, I might be wrong, I might be wrong. So people online, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But it seemed like it broke down for her by tenths, meaning she get a thousand. Um, queries, a uh, thousand queries, she'd ask for a hundred uh, sample chapters. Of the hundred sample chapters, she would ask for ten full manuscripts to read, and of those ten, she would pick one of them to represent. That might be too reductive. Um, of these thousand, half are going to be queries sent to an agent representing the wrong uh, material. Meaning, half of those are going to be, they're sending to Joshua a children's book um, when he doesn't do children's books, you know, like a picture book. Or they are sending to a mainstream literary um, um, agent or editor a science fiction novel or a high fantasy novel. Half the people historically have no idea what they're doing. Um, Leading Edge gets a little bit better uh, than that, don't you think? Is it, or is it? We get we get mostly stuff that's sci-fi yeah. or fantasy. Whether it's good is yeah. a completely different yeah. question. Yeah, but um, but half of those they say for um, for literary agent for queries because queries are so easy to send off. Half of those have no idea what they're doing. Okay. Um, of these thousand uh, hundred sample chapters, you can toss away 
75 of them after the first paragraph, I'd say. Um, just like if 100 people sat down, like I said, to play piano for you, if they think they can play piano, you will be able to tell after five minutes which ones you would pay money, good money, to go see, and which ones you wouldn't. Okay? So, this is where, this hunt getting here is where all that stuff I talked about, what is it, two, three weeks ago? All that stuff, that's how you get past this hundred um, hurdle. To get past this hurdle, do all of this. Or learn to write really good query letters. I'm horrible at them. Um, but it's basically your elevator pitch tweaked a little bit more to bring it like one step closer to this um, is your query. Um, but yeah, um, you can bypass that by meeting the editors or just write really good queries. Um, but get past this by doing that. Get past this by practicing a whole lot and being able to carry a plot. This is stuff, all the rest of the stuff I'm going to talk about in the class is that sort of stuff. Speaking of query letters, um, when you say, to, if you go and you meet an editor and they say, send this to me, or when you send a query letter and you know the editor's name, would, would it be better, do you think, to um, just send the letter with the editor's name, or if in the writing submissions they say, send it to No, send the it to the editor. If the editor asks for it, send it directly to the editor. In fact, one of the main reasons to do what I'm talking about here is to skip that. Because um, usually on the website they will list acquisitions editor for a lot of the big publishers. That just means put it in the stack. And any editor who walks by will and may end up reading it. You don't know which one. Um, sometimes there is an acquisitions editor whose dedicated job is to read the acquisition stuff and then pass it on to other editors to acquire. I think our Deseret both works that way. I think they have an acquisitions editor and a separate person who works on the book once they bought it. Am I right on that for Shadow Mountain? Yeah. Um, and some publishers work that way. Um, but if you've met one in person, they will tell you to send the acquisitions editor if that's what you're supposed to do. If they don't, you'll just pass the big hurdle and hurrah for you. One of the main reasons to do what we're talking about. You're just shaving off this one, if you can, by meeting them. Sometimes they'll accept the whole manuscript, but you often don't want to send the whole manuscript because once you send the whole manuscript, you're basically committing. Um, there's a kind of a gentleman's gr agreement in publishing that if someone has the full manuscript, they get to consider it until they say yes or no um, and then reject it. That's slowly fading away and becoming not as much um, an issue, but they call it simultaneous submissions. Some editors are fine with it. Uh, but if they don't say anything, generally, one person can have the full manuscript at a time. Um, and that's just kind of the way, it's a, a gentleman's agreement that is not very favorable to the authors. Um, agents are allowed to send to as many people as they want. Yeah. Do they ever let you know, like, I'm not interested so you can send to other people? Or? Um, yes, they do. They should be sending you rejection letters if they're on the ball. If you don't hear from them um, in six months is usually what they say. Uh, so you can send them a postcard and say, hey, um, are you still considering this? Um, by the way, this is why you want to have more than one book. Um, a launcher set on Moshe's desk for 18 months. Um, yeah. So uh, let's say that you do send it to two people, yeah. and you sell it, and you yeah. just send a postcard to the first guy saying, hey, by the way, this has been acquired. Yeah, as long as they both take simultaneous, then that'll be So fine. what's the problem? What's that? So if you can do that, what's the problem? The problem is that um, this is the story that they say is the reason to stay away from it. I don't know how viable it is, but remember, this is a very small community. They all have lunch with, with each other. They all know each other very well. If one of them says, hey, I just got this great submission, it's this and this and this, and the other one says, wow, I got that too, they could both just say, oh, this is person is not respecting the gentleman's agreement and both reject it. That's the classic story that they tell. I don't know how likely that is, but that's the story they tell. Um, and if you send it to both and they reject it, both, and they mention it to each other, you could be in real trouble. If they both like it, they're not going to really reject it because they both like it. They're both going to try and grab it. Um, but so it's a do at your own risk sort of thing. Um, I don't think it's as big of a deal as it once was. 
a lot of like motion takes un, um, takes simultaneous because he takes so long. Um, and so I wouldn't. If, if you're fine with that, then go ahead and do it. But know that this is kind of how the community is, um, and it's it's why if someone gets if you get to this stage after they've read the sample chapters. They're going to get to it faster, usually. It's when you do what I did and just send them the whole manuscript right out that you end up with the longer wait times because you really haven't passed. You know, you've skipped two and jumped right up there. Um, and that can kind of backfire. And it can be good for you because then they have the whole manuscript. But I, as a new writer, didn't quite understand this whole they can read it so well in three chapters. Um, but anyway, if you honestly, if you, um, if you get to this stage, and let's say you've sent out your manuscript to, to 12 editors, let's say nine of them get back wanting sample chapters, um, or even full. So let's, say you, that, let's go that way. You've sent out sample chapters <coughs> to 12, and nine of them want the full. You probably have enough um, of an interest then to call one of the agents that you've met at the cons that you know and say, hey, I just sent this out. I've got nine people who want the full. Would you be interested in looking at it too? Because I may be in over my head here. Um, and almost always, that agent will say, yeah, go ahead and send me the full. I'll look at it. Um, and they'll get to it pretty fast in that case. Does that make sense? That depends on if you want an agent or not. We'll have to do an entire um, day on agents. We also will have to do an entire day on self-publishing and contracts. So I hope that you don't mind that about half of this class is business-oriented sort of stuff. I tried to warn you. Um, but next week I will try to do a um, writing craft lecture um, rather, than, rather than this. I mean, we have, hit, um, we have hit outlining and we have hit characters, so I, I feel like I've, I've got some stuff for you. We'll try to do plot next time. So is it like a country club where they like you and you get in? Or if you're really good but they hate you, you won't get in? It can be, but I don't think it really happens that way. Um, famous people in, in the business who are famously jerks still get published as long as they sell. If they don't, they get dumped real fast. Yeah. Um, do the editors like make more money like the more the book sells, or how does yes. that work? Editors make more money not based on how the books sell, usually. So they have good motivation for finding good books. All right, let's go ahead and break it here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I am with group... Um, wild card, I think, which is group number four, I think. Let me find the name. Group three, 